Kevin Vallier is a philosopher at Bowling Green State University. He's a PPE specialist and prolific author, both of peer-reviewed articles and books. He's also somewhat of a regular at IHS events, including the recent manuscript workshop centered around his next book. This week, though, he joins us to talk about his most recent book, Must Politics Be War? in Defense of Public Reason Liberalism. All right, so before we get into my sort of anarchist, radical, kind of wackadoo criticisms of your argument, can, uh, can you explain to us what is your thesis in your most recent book, Must Politics Be War? Well, the basic thesis is that if we have a genuinely liberal politics, one of limited government and extensive basic liberties, then that um, provides the foundation for people to trust one another despite their differences. And I argue in the book that we avoid a warlike politics when we can sustain high levels of trust in one another and in government. So the key to showing that politics doesn't have to be war is showing the feasibility and stability of high levels of trust. And then you just say, well, what are the institutions that sustain trust or that, could, that are promising in that regard? And then I argue that liberal rights have that feature. Um, the, the basic reason is, is relatively simple. I mean, if you understand liberal rights as each group or person being able to kind of go their own way as an alternative to more hegemonic arrangements where one person's doctrine or religion or ideology takes charge, um, then you can see why people with different ideas, with different commitments, uh, would find it easier to trust one another because no one group is imposing their values on the other. When the hegemon's in charge, they can't trust the subverted group. Subverted group doesn't acknowledge their authority in the end, and so will tend to defect from social rules that are imposed by the hegemon. And similarly, the subverted group can't trust the hegemon um, because they are seen as immoral or unjust in opposing alien values. So a regime that tries to establish no particular ideology, including libertarianism, um, is going to be the one that does the best at providing each other, uh, providing people with good reasons to be trustworthy by following those kinds of liberal constitutional rules. So that, that's, the, that's the basic idea, is that you have a non-warlike politics when you have trust, you can get trust when you have uh, individual and group liberty. And now this is, this is what's referred to as a public reason account. Am uh -huh. I in that? Uh -huh. I'm not a philosopher. Not to brag, but I'm not a philosopher. <laughs> uh. <laughs> it is a merit. It is a merit. So tell us, tell us about that term then. What, what, what does this mean, a public reason account of liberalism? So um, there's a couple of different ways of explaining it, but um, the basic idea is to try to contrast it with a term that your readers may be, or your listeners may be more familiar with, which is the idea of a perfectionist liberalism as, say, one that's based in Aristotelian ideas of flourishing. On this view, the case for liberal institutions is that they help people to live good lives or to live the best life, that it's the job of the state uh, in some way to promote the human good, even when people reasonably disagree about what the good is. Public reason liberals acknowledge a kind of and defend a kind of constraint <clears throat> on the use of state power in order, <coughs> pardon me, in order to promote um, the good in cases where it's reasonably contested. So the public reason liberal says that, well, look, state power has to be justifiable to each person given their own worldview. And so it's wrong for the state to take a position on matters about which people reasonably disagree. Um, so it's particularly this idea of public justification where political power has to be justified to each point of view and that it prohibits the state promoting the human good, which many of your listeners will like <clears throat> in broad outline in one way. Um, and in fact, there have been libertarian attempts to try to synthesize perfectionist uh, moral theory of the sort you see in Ayn Rand with a uh, anti-perfectionist politics, so Doug Denial and Rasmussen. So there have been attempts to try to um, uh, bring those together, but public reason liberalism is trying to contrast itself with a perfectionist approach to politics, one that's based on promoting the authentic human good. Now there are a lot of strands that I want to tease at there, so I guess I guess I'll sure. have to I'll have to take it one at a time because there's a there's a whole lot there I, I want to unpack. With sure. You. And now I'm a I'm a historian and I have a particular interest in radical movements and I really love the English Civil War for example. Uh -huh, it's just uh -huh. this explosion 
of all sorts of different uh, forms of radicalism, dissenting religious traditions, different new political traditions, uh, different kinds of movements of people taking direct action to do one sort of thing or another uh, that, that is their particular hobby horse. Um, and it is the, the <laughs> political, military, social, ideological mess and disaster in a way of the Civil War period that causes somebody like John Locke to try to systematize politics such that it's not subject to these kinds of violent trials and tribulations uh, that turn the world upside down and invert everything. Um, and he gives one of the earlier attempts to publicly justify uh, your mm -hmm. your slate of liberal rights. Uh, yeah, I wonder yeah. first if He's you could just uh, public reason. yeah get, comment on on John Locke and his sort of historical role in generating these ideas a bit for us. So um, the problem for Locke in the state of nature is not the same as Hobbes, but they do share a dilemma, <clears throat> which is that there exist natural moral principles, natural laws but that people are naturally inclined to interpret and imply, apply them differently. Um, e and given that people are free and equal, the question is, the problem is, as Hobbes says, no man's reason makes the certainty. Or for Locke, the idea of the, the, so the problem of private judgment can take a relatively peaceful state of nature and can periodically collapse it to a state of war. Though, of course, for Locke, you can have the state of war under the state as well. So the basic problem, I think, for Locke and Hobbes is how do we solve disputes about the interpretation of the natural law? Natural law theory in the past and much of the medieval period was not really focused on the problem of disagreement. And they tended to think that people who were sufficiently virtuous wouldn't disagree all that much. But the way that Hobbes and Locke thought about the way that we cognize things, the way that we think, they thought it was inevitable that we were going to disagree about what the natural law implies. And so what they suggested was that we needed some form of public judge, some arbitrator to which we could all submit our private judgments that could render a public judgment that would allow us to live together in peace and to cooperate. Um, and that indeed for Locke, more than Hobbes, that would create a public trust. That word public, that phrase public trust appears in the second treatise dozens of times. It's very seldom talked about. The idea is to provide an authoritative interpretation of the natural law so that people can get on with social life together and perhaps maybe even flourish. But Locke thought, unlike Hobbes, that <clears throat> we had enough of a grasp on natural law that we wouldn't give up all of our interpretive power. We'd only give up some of it. Now, there are some times where he says, look, all private judgment is excluded, but he, he means the, the private judgment of the part we choose to alienate. So for, ha for Locke, you know, natural rights are constrained on how much authority we're going to alienate and on the kinds of judgment or authority that we're going to alienate. So, so Locke has both a doctrine of natural rights, but he also has a doctrine of public reason in the sense of, of public judgment. Um, and many libertarian theories focus entirely on natural rights and entirely omit the problem of private judgment, whereas non-libertarians tend to focus almost entirely on the public judgment, the public reason part of Locke, rather than a natural law and natural rights. And my own view is, you know, they're going to hang together in this elegant way in the end. Well, see, now, uh, <laughs> I always seem to get uh, hung up on Locke because, in a, yeah, in a way, I, me too. I can't. I love him. I, in a way, I can't stand him because I, oh. I think he plays this nefarious and tricky historical <laughs> role as a thinker and just a. a, a you know, historical figure otherwise, writing constitutions for the New World, for example, defending slavery. Hello, that was a low, a low point, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but now, so it seems to me, again, in, in his historical context... Well, he's against slavery, though. I mean, I mean, yes, he's, he permits it in the Constitution of the Carolinas, but, I mean, just to stick up for Locke, I mean, you know... Well, he's, I mean, the, he says, yeah, the basis is there. And what he says in the, in the second treatise that it's uh, it's an extension of the state of war. Right. Which to me is just an excuse for uh, well, I, conflicts in I, the period that that 
you know, uh, are not actually like it's an abstraction applied to r real context that don't deserve oh, the application. I, I have a much more charitable read of that. <laughs> I think he thinks that if you allow slavery after war, that will keep people from getting killed because at least they can be slaves. That is a common so, argument that that people yeah. like, for example, the early slave traders made. They made that yeah. uh, as a, a, a fairly, at least in the case of the slave traders, a fairly transparent excuse for uh, continuing to get all the, the riches of the, the burgeoning slave trade. Um, but then they, they had their other, their other favorite lists of uh, excuses that, that basically this is in the interest of the Africans and the Africans are doing this to themselves. Oh, yeah. The application of the, the theory can be corrupted. Um, but if you have a kind of law and economics approach to some of this, then you may think, well, in the cases in which it would apply, um, you could imagine it. But not having authority for very long, of course, I'm not defending it. I'm just trying to say why Locke might think – says why he might say what he says and – mean well, but I understand uh, the other perspective. Well, this is what I mean when I say, you know, I, I look at him as sort of a, a tricky character in a lot of ways. And I, so I want to, uh, I want to go back to this point about public reason because yep, he is, good. he is very much, I, I think, uh, uh, at least again, this is how I read him. He's, he's very much trying to give this public reason account and give so much weight to it precisely because he wants to be sure that such a a uh, revolutionary event as the English Civil Wars did not happen again, and and he he wanted to make sure that the entire you know structure of society would not be turned upside down like that again, uh, and so he kind of he generates his own version of a justifiable account and says, well, look, since since we're going to to do government significantly differently now uh, after the the Civil Wars. And after the restoration, then uh, it turns out that it's it's going to be much more legitimate, and uh, you know more people should buy into this project, and we, we have this whole slate of rights and everything else that you can count on. But it's it's also a keystone part of the classical liberal historical tradition to accept this idea that politics is inherently warfare, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and I think a lot of that generated at least as early as the English Civil Wars when, again, dissenting traditions, people like the Diggers, they knew that politics was inherently warfare precisely because everybody around them in political life was making war on them and trying to, you know, destroy their, their uh, lifestyle and livelihood. And then along comes uh, uh, the, somebody like, like John Locke and, and says, you know, well, you guys basically have to buy into what most people agree with because it's, you know, quote, publicly justified and reasonable and liberal and all this other good sounding stuff. But yet it still has the effect of stamping out uh, minority traditions. And so I wonder, isn't politics really warfare? So there's two nice points there. So you, you, you said this, you said this bit about what about the min minority groups? And I want to address that because a big problem in Locke's conception of public reason is that he says at one point uh, that all private judgment is to be excluded in the domain of uh, of judgment um, that covers that he's meant to cover of what you alienate. Um, and this creates the sense that what public justification is supposed to do is it's supposed to proceed in terms of shared reasons. <clears throat> such that the diverse reasons of groups like the diggers, their unusual or marginalized values, play no role in the public justification of legislation. But my whole first book on liberal politics and public faith pushes back against that model of public reason, whereas I argue in favor of what I call a convergence model on which people's diverse reasons figure into public justifications. So the idea is that in that case, the kind of repression of groups like the diggers because of their private reasoning or their unusual or sectarian doctrines works very, very differently. I don't think there would be repression because their reasons can figure in as defeaters for laws. It's one reason I defend a strong regime of religious exemptions. Um, whereas, you know, Hobbes and even Locke, I think, to, it, in certain places, looks like they'd actually be pretty hostile to those. Um, so, so I like to think that it's just a sort of weakness in their doctrine of public reason, but not a weakness in the doctrine of public reason itself. So, so that's the first thing I wanted to say is that there's different models of public reason. And Hobbes and Locke you know, didn't have the best model. 
So that's the first thing I'd say. <clears throat> the second thing is um, what I'm doing and asking must politics be wars. I'm trying to translate it into a more empirically and in some ways philosophically tractable question. And the way I'm doing that is by trying to understand a warlike politics in terms of levels of trust, particularly social trust, the trust that people have in each other, that we're going to follow what we regard as the basic moral rules of our order. The ones that, you know, we're tempted to read into reality, perhaps rightly, as natural laws or prima facie duties or, you know, intuitive principles. And that are also social norms in the sense that they're generally followed. So a low trust society in this sense is a tinderbox, right? Even if everyone's of goodwill, they all think that others might violate the rules. Um, in which case, you know, you're going to uh, be on the have be in a state of fear in any case where uh, conflict can erupt. But in a high trust society, there are all these tools, common social norms, moral rules by which people can use to uh, that you, people can use to end their conflicts. Um so then the question, must politics be war, becomes the question of how do we sustain high levels of social trust in ways that we ordinarily think are appropriate? And that becomes a partly empirical question. And then we can look at different societies and say, what are the high trust societies doing that the low trust societies are not doing? Um, so the, the thought is, if you translate the problem, must politics be war, into the question of the feasibility of trust of certain kind? Um, I think Sweden's politics is not really war very much. Right? Whereas the U.S. politics is much closer to war because our social trust levels are half of theirs. That is, about a third of people say most people can be trusted in our country, whereas about two thirds say it in theirs. Um, so we have to figure out how to get high levels of trust. If we can do that, then we can end a warlike politics. But right now it's a matter of degree and we're moving in a more warlike direction because we're the only major liberal democracy that I know of whose social trust level has fallen substantially uh, since the se early 70s. So we've gone from around half to around a third, which is actually a really big drop. Usually internationally, social trust levels are very stable. Well, I got to say the, the 10 to 15 percent or so of me that is uh, sort of Marxist is kind of <laughs> screaming out. But those folks in Sweden who have such high public trust – Surely they're just, you know, bought into the mythology of the modern state or the modern, you know, social welfare, uh, social democracy system. Uh, and it's not actually that the, the system they live in is not actually worthy of their trust, but they've granted it for the purposes of upholding a, a, a fundamentally mythological politics. Hmm. Yeah, this is this is pretty interesting. Um, you know, I mean, if there's a lot of trust, then there's a certain way in which it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So <clears throat> the thought is that, look, if they really if they really trust, I mean, so there's two ways in which it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. One, I think people often respond to trust with trustworthy behavior and, and they don't just run off on people. And I think there's actually a lot of evidence that um, hi higher trust societies, politicians behave better than in low trust societies. Um, so um, in one way, when you have higher trust, you actually get, I think, more trustworthy behavior. It's not just trustworthy behavior to trust direction of fit in terms of attitudes. So it's kind of a causal feedback loop. Another element is that, you know, I mean, to the extent that they buy the mythos, I think it becomes a somewhat voluntary organization. It's a bit like a church. It's just a big, Sweden's just a big church of social democracy, but that's their religion now. Um, so there's, you know, it's a false religion in the end, but on the other hand, you know, lots of people have false religions. So, um, but we don't think, oh, there's a grave injustice here because they worship the wrong God. We just think, well, they've consented to something that's not true. Um, and that's kind of, I think of Sweden is that they've largely consented to something that's not true. Now there are a lot of exceptions. Swedish state isn't so, so great, but I mean, compared to almost every other state that's ever existed in history or all around the world today, it's extraordinary. Um, what it's able to accomplish. Um, they've actually undergone one of the biggest privatizations and deregulations uh, in the world uh, from the 80s to today. And they did it relatively smoothly and in response to the widely understood recognition that democratic socialism had failed. Um, they voluntarily adopted free markets over and over again. Um, so. Well, then, now, so just sort of as a, a follow up question to that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One of the most important um, 
historians in American intellectual history is a guy named Lewis Hartz, who was a socialist, uh, and he wrote a lot about the influence of John Locke uh, over American history. And his, his argument was that Locke was of such staggering and titanic importance um, that there were almost you know, no serious detractors from Lockean liberalism in all of American history. And what, what small handful of exceptions you can find only prove the rule. So I'm wondering, and, and you know, to, to Hartz, this was a tragedy because, again, he's a socialist. He, he hates private property and things like that. He, he saw this as a failure, part of the inherent failure of socialism in America. Uh, Locke was too hegemonic to have any room for the socialist revolution. And, and yet, you know, the part of the point that you were making or you, that you want to make throughout this book is, is saying that, you know, the, the package of liberal rights and the kind of public reason uh, justification you're giving uh, is not supposed to become a hegemonic system of values. Good, good. So um, <coughs> this is a really difficult problem because most public reason models, in fact, very few until very recently, allow for reasonable disagreement about justice. You know, for all, justice is just a way we resolve our competing claims. And if we disagree about the good, we need a notion of justice in order to help us sort through our problems. As you allow for reasonable disagreement about justice, things to kind of start to fall apart. Um, so then the question becomes, how do you find a regime of rights that people with different theories of justice can overlap on? And there I concede to the left that libertarians will have to be willing to allow for some redistribution to provide for basic social welfare. Libertarians won't think this is just. They won't think it's the best. But if they care about living in a society where they can cooperate with and trust non-libertarians, which is almost everybody, there are certain concessions they have to be prepared to make. Now, I think in the case of out-and-out -out socialism, things are quite different. Um, because uh, what, what they're advocating is so dramatically coercive and um, so manifestly inefficient that it's just not, we, we, we sort of understand uh, on reflection that it's not really a good way to organize society anymore. Um, so the thought is that it, it's almost impossible to publicly justify socialism because there's a lot of people that would rather have anarchy than socialism. Now, I know you say, look, a lot of socialists would prefer anarchy to libertarianism, but would they really prefer it to a society that was liberal, democratic, and that had a functional welfare state? Then I think they'll think, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to gamble with anarchy just to get what I want because it, this society isn't, you know, isn't great, but it's, it's something I can tolerate. Well, you know, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up that point because I was going to ask you, you know, uh, part of the problem with uh, classical liberalism today across academia, I think, is that it's, uh, it's, it's somewhat difficult sometimes to uh, talk with our left-leaning colleagues uh, yep. and yeah. get them to take this package of ideas or even, the, even liberalism as a, as a broad intellectual tradition or concern seriously that it's so fallen out of out of political favor with most academics that they just simply don't seem to care about it even as a historical phenomenon anymore um, yeah and so I'm wondering you know what kind of ways would you quote market this concept of civil society to historically marginalized and exploited people who who very often see liberalism is, is kind of like an, a set of excuses for rich white men to continue getting away with, <laughs> with exploitation, kind of in the way that I was describing uh -huh. earlier. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the one of the main tools that I think religious minorities and other minorities can be, um, can be used to respect those groups is by allowing for exemptions from generally applicable laws. So, but my view is that um, religious exemptions, legal exemptions should apply not just to people of faith, but also to secular people and not just to secular people who think, you know, that certain forms of life, like being drafted, say, are bad, <clears throat> but to communities that have different conceptions of justice. So, for instance, I think that the Free State Project has a, a fairly decent chance of being able to be publicly justified um, because they're not trying to take over the whole country. They're not trying to destroy the welfare state as such. They're just saying, look, we're going to convince people in our region to 
negotiate for more, you know, state level authority. And I think, you know, federalism is a way that you give groups a, a sort of justice based exemption. You say, look, you can construct your own local order. So public reason ends up being really federalist, on my view. Um, and it ends up having a pretty robust role for exemptions in order to deal with precisely the problems that you bring up. Now, what other kinds of concessions would you personally be willing to make, or do you think that classical liberals should seriously consider? I mean, you mentioned something that it sounded like you were going in the direction of a, a universal basic income or, or some sort of scheme like it. Um, and you know, I'm wondering, what other kinds of concessions do you think would be legitimate to consider? The main concession really is over redistribution. Um, when it comes to other things that libertarians tend to emphasize, like uh, foreign policy, uh, misadventures, and restrictions of civil liberties, they're going to have you know what I call defeater reasons or you know strong reasons to reject these kind of policies that um, they would rather you know not have done at all. So um, uh, because these policies of restricting civil liberties and going to war, coercion initiating. Whereas in many ways, the property rights, and I think sometimes libertarians can't see this, um, are coerced, you know, when you defend them, you have to defend them with coercion. Um, so I think that there's a kind of asymmetry between a libertarian's insistence, say, on no redistribution and that all taxation is theft, and the thought that, look, the U.S. government's going to be, you know, murdering hundreds of thousands of people and, oh, it's going to like monitor you all the time. Um, those aren't concessions that libertarians need to make. Um, so, I mean, be, so beyond that, uh oh, it's, it's largely redistribution, but there is one really important exception, <clears throat> but doesn't apply to all libertarians, but it does apply to some, which is <clears throat> anti-discrimination law. So I think that libertarians have to be willing to uh, acknowledge the authority of a, a, a lot more anti-discrimination law than they are now because they tend to want to say that none can be justified at all. So, for instance, I think if you're in a southern state and most people are using their property rights in order to sy systematically exclude and degrade a racial minority, then the racial minority is going to have good reason to reject or defeater reasons for those coercive property rights arrangements such that the law can intervene to protect them through anti-discrimination law. Um, but I actually think resistance to any discri anti-discrimination laws, maybe one of libertarianism as a doctrine's great weaknesses. Um, and it's something I think libertarians should be prepared to take on board, even though many aren't. So I guess there's an example. I, but I do want to stress to your listeners that um, on the things that libertarians really, really care about, many of them, no concession is needed. Now, those are, those are ideas for uh, sort of policy concessions, but does this mean that sort of in your everyday life, in your social interactions with people, you have to try to make nice and sort of shake hands and be friendly with people who uh, have really horrible ideas from, you know, <laughs> the, the, the nice kind of horrible ideas like social democracy to the nasty kind of horrible ideas like uh, fascism or, you know, some of the well, tanky left or something like that? It depends on how much you care about being able to maintain relations of trust with those other people. And I think people have really good reason to care about maintaining those relationships because trust is of such fundamental value, empirically speaking. Um, but there are some people, if you think, look, I mean, they're not even trustworthy with respect to the basic moral rules of our order, then there's no reason to trust them. So the social democratic left, I mean, it's gonna be trustworthy with respect to lots of norms. Um, whereas the sort of tanky left is gonna be trying to tear the whole system down, including everything you kind of hold dear. So I think it's perfectly legitimate to um, be much, much more critical and forceful with folks um, who are trying to impose coercion and control that <clears throat> many people reasonably reject than people who are just proposing uh, something more, a lot more mild, even if they're misguided. So it does vary based on what people are actually wanting to do. Uh, we can be harsher with the Marxist than we can with the sweet, or you know, the sort of Swedish free market uh, welfare state person, capitalist welfare state person. And now, as I understand it, uh, this book "Must Politics Be War" is part of a sort of series that you have going, and uh, that's correct. The latest of which was 
subject of a manuscript workshop here uh, with Correct. IHS just last month. I, I yes, was wondering yep. if you could tell us a bit about the manuscript sure. workshop and uh, what this next book will be like. Well, it was a wonderful experience, uh, and I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity. But here's basically how the two books are related. The first book asks the question, must politics be war in principle? Because a lot of people think, no, politics is such as war. So there's no, that, that's not strictly speaking an empirical question about the real world. That's a more lofty philosophical question. Um, and I start to answer it by trying to say, look, our moral psychology is broadly compatible with trust across different perspectives, and that's what ends a war like politics. But there is an additional question, which is of equal, if not greater importance, which is, do liberal democratic institutions create trust in the real world of real people? So the next book, A Liberal Democratic Peace, Creating Trust in Polarized Times, it's also coming out with Oxford and with, with Luck, it'll be out in November, um, that, it makes that argument. It takes the liberal institutions that I think are publicly justified and goes through the empirical literature and political science and economics that's been building for decades uh, to try to show that many of those same institutions promote trust. There's some that where we can't detect an effect yet. Uh, freedom of speech, press, and religion don't seem to have much of an effect, which is odd, but we, we can't find one. But there are a number of different things that do seem to matter. Freedom of association helps some. Uh, basic market economy, like the integrity of legal property rights, not necessarily tax rates. Um, those seem to help trust social and tr trust and trust in government. Uh, high quality of governance in terms of operation by the rule of law. Uh, and, um, you know, sort of general constitutional constraints on power that reduce corruption and rent-seeking. Those, I think, are highly trust-promoting. Uh, and then I think elections help, um, but uh, it's more complicated to show given the data. It's also important that there be some basic forms of economic security, but the data is ambiguous on whether those have to be um, – provided through government funds or whether they can be provided with privatized social services. Um, so uh, those are the institutions for which I think there's evidence that they help trust in the real world that also I think can be publicly justified. So that's what's going to going on uh, in that book. So uh, and, and while the Must Politics Be War is more aimed at uh, philosophers, so, you know, it's a little more expensive. This next book will be under thirty dollars. And I think they make a nice pair um, but for, for folks who are interested in that philosophical challenge, you should get the first book. But if you're interested in the empirical data, um, then the second book is, 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 for, is more for you. Um, so if you're – I mean I think both problems are important. First, you have to get the philosophical problem off the ground. You have to say, look, uh, non-warlike politics is feasible for us. And then you come in and you say, OK, look, actually here's what's going on in the real world, and that adds to the argument. But either book can be read entirely on their own. Kevin Vallier has my absolute greatest thanks for joining us on the show this week, for indulging me in my skeptical form of harassment. He put up a great defense. And after all, that in itself is sort of a form of evidence, at least, for his point of view. A lot of us out here feel a bit tapped out of public reason at this particular historical juncture. But hey, maybe that's exactly the sort of role we classical liberal academics can take on out there in the arena. For our own part, we can't wait to hear more about Professor Vallier's ideas in progress.